Good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy Gao, and I'm with the Hatfield Historical Society, which is jointly hosting this event with the Waitley Historical Society. And we're very happy and thankful to Waitley for putting the meeting on here tonight. So you're here tonight to hear our speaker, Barry Dietz, who's been in the area for about five years. And in that five years, he's been giving this talk on the construction of 91 on and off. And I don't know if you've heard about this talk from someone else, but I, I, I would like to ask who's heard about this talk from someone who's heard it, if you could put your hand way up in the air. So we've got a handful. Um, I have to say that the um, people who have heard this talk before uh, speak highly of it, and so I, I think we're in for a real treat tonight. So if you would welcome Barry Dietz. Well, thank you. What a crowd. My gosh, you know, if you do a, a, a historical program, people come out for it. And that's wonderful, especially up here. Now, uh, I've got the, I'm gonna keep this nearby, but if I tromp away, you can still hear me? Okay. I, uh, the years of theater, you know, when you get in front of, a, if you've ever done theater in your life, and you get in front of other people, that theater gene just kicks in. I'm glad to be here. Now, it's probably obvious by about right now that I'm not from around here. <laughs> I am from North Carolina. Well, thank you. So, I, um, the first question has got to be, what's a guy from North Carolina doing up here talking about an uh, interstate going through Massachusetts? And it's a good question, and I really don't have a great answer for it. But I will tell you that it's the result of some curiosity. It's a result in my own interest in history. It's because I'm a storyteller, and it's because of an interesting question I was asked. Now, I do programs. I do literary history programs. That's what I do. I travel all around the state and up into Vermont, and I do stories about literary history. Uh, I do a program on Christmas and Charles Dickens and writing of the Christmas Carol and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> and so I've done a program in Greenfield, and someone came up to me afterwards, and she said, you should come and do a program for the Pioneer Valley Institute. Well, I said, well, I would love to do that. That sounds wonderful. What's the Pioneer Valley? <laughs> she said, the Pioneer Valley is where you now live. And she said, you should do a program. And I was like, well, no. I mean, I just moved up here. I'm new here. Nobody wants to hear me come up and talk about something I don't know anything about. And she said, well, why don't you could talk about being a southerner and moving up to New England, which I did, in fact, do. Uh, years and years ago, I met a wonderful Yankee girl down in North Carolina who dragged me back here. But I thought, well, I don't know, though. I'll, I'll think about that. And so it was in that context that I had a conversation with an old historian in Berniston. And I was talking about how I had grown up in Charlotte, in Gastonia, North Carolina, near I-85, a big roaring interstate. And if you've ever been down there, I-85 just crashes through everything, crashes through the middle of every city. You can travel from Charlotte all the way down to Atlanta, Georgia, and never be outside of the view of a Walmart <laughs> or a strip mall of some sort. There are almost no trees. It is nothing but built up all the way. And I was telling him, and I said, you know, it's really interesting up here when you drive on 91. It's so rural. And you'll have these long stretches. There'll, there'll be a sign saying, you know, exit 16 or whatever. And then a little placard under it saying, next exit, 16 miles. <laughs> well, where I come from, the next exit's never over two miles away. And it's all just trees till you get to the next exit. And so I was talking with him about that. And I said, except, though, when you come up here to Berniston, the highway comes right smack through the middle of town. And he said, well, that's because the, the uh, interstate split the town in half when it came to it. And I said, well, that was really unusual. He said, well, you know, my dad hated 91. He hated the building of 91. And I said, why? He said, because him and his friends lost all their best fishing holes. And I said, what? 
He said when they built 91 coming down from Vermont through Burmeston, they relocated the Falls River. And we lost all the fishing holes mm -hmm. because the Fall River had been a zigzaggy little river, which is, and you know it's in those bends and curves where it digs down deep to get you a good fishing hole. They straightened the river out so that it would run parallel to the highway. They relocated it and they lost the fishing holes. And I thought, who'd have thought of that? That's an aspect of, of technology and a highway coming through a, a, an area you just don't think about. And then a couple of weeks after that, I was talking to two men, and it was actually my father-in-law, who was very interested in local history, and he's bedridden. And I was asking him about it, and I said, you know, I've got a question about 91. He said, I said, what's the main thing that happened, in your opinion, when 91 came through? What's the most devastating thing? What's the, most, the thing that you remember most? He said that it destroyed all the businesses on Route 5. Because you had gas stations and garages and restaurants and fruit stands that relied on people driving by all day long. And I was talking, you know, so I have a little notebook there. But before I could even scribble that in my notebook, the other man who was his, the male nurse he worked with, he said, oh, don't listen to him. It was wonderful when 91 came through. It was so much easier to get to Vermont for the skiing. <laughs> and I remember thinking, there's the story of how a road can shift a community completely. It can bring all kinds of wonderful things and all kinds of awful things. It can split your farm in half. So now that half of your land is on the other side of the road with no access to it, but it can also mean you can buy a lot of candles around here. <laughs> because the road opens up trade possibilities. You can sit in Greenfield and have a dinner of Thai food because of 91. And so there began my quest to understand a little more about this. So what I want to do is take you through what I have discovered about 91, about the interstate system. What I would like to do is, kind of particularly talking to the historical societies here, I am not a historian. I'm a storyteller, though. And so I want to share some of the stories I came around, digging around about this, to try and find out what was going on. I'm going to try to set up the context of the building of the road in the state and in the nation. Because the building of the interstate system, you know, some people will tell you that the only man-made thing on Earth visible from outer space is the Great Wall of China. And that's not true. The United States highway system is visible from space. It is the largest public works project in human history. And so I want to pull all of that into it as well, with the background of the highway system, why it all happened. So where are we going to start? Well, we're going to start with a great, wonderful picture, right? There it is. 291 miles, 58 miles through Connecticut, 55 miles through Massachusetts, and 178 through Vermont. And there it goes, all the way up to the Canadian border. So when you announce to a community we're going to bring a 500-foot-wide, two-lane, double-barreled superhighway, which is what they love to call it, the double-barreled superhighway through your region. How does that information come to you first? It comes as drawings, lovely drawings that show no kind of car wrecks. They never show the traffic on these drawings, do they? But they show you what it's going to look like when it comes through. And so we have, we have a lovely drawing here, and you'll note here, Falls River Relocation. All down through there where they have straightened it up, which is proof that the man was right. They did indeed straighten out the Falls River so that it would come along the highway. So that's how it is, a proposed location. And so this, and notice relocation of Route 5, it has not yet been named. It wasn't until February of 58 that they gave it the name 91. Initially, in the early announcements, it was just going to be called the New Route 5. And so that's kind of nice, and that doesn't look like that's going to be too traumatic, does it? That looks a lot different, doesn't it? 
because that's what really happens. It just comes crashing through. This is the border between Vermont and Massachusetts. Vermont has come down to here with the construction of their road, and construction of the one in Massachusetts has not happened yet. And so there we are, coming down out of nowhere. And note the title here, it says, Wide High Road to Nowhere. But I think it's just a little ominous. But that's really what happens when the interstate comes through your region. Here's another view. And again, this is a big aerial view. Here you see the construction of 91. Right there is the Vermont border. And so look at, look at, look at how different it is. I mean, it's, it's a stark reminder in a way we don't often think about on the ground about what is happening with the construction of road. So, so what does go into the construction of a highway of this caliber? To create a road this big, one mile of road requires 15 to 40 acres of land, 40,000 cubic yards of earth, rock, and peat, 30,000 cubic yards of gravel, 5,000 tons of crushed stone, 5,000 cubic yards of cement, 25,000 square yards of steel reinforcement, 4,000 feet of guardrail, and 7,000 feet of stock wood fence. For one mile? For one mile of interstate. <clears throat> and that raking in of the land to build up the road came of all kinds of consequences. I was talking to a woman who has a tree farm in Greenfield, the Emerson Tree Farm. And they had a segment of, when they bought up the farm, there was a segment of about 50 acres down near 91 along the highway that had never been planted. And so a couple of years ago, they planted 100 trees there. And when they came up, they were awful. They were stunted, and they just not working out. They didn't get anything that they could sell. And when they checked the soil, they discovered that all the topsoil was gone. It had all been raked off to create 91. Now think about the farmers along that road who are planting that. Think it, and think that this is 50 years after the construction of the road. So that's what goes into it. And here we are again. This is the construction of, this is uh, coming up from Greenfield up to Burniston. One of the things about this project all the way across the board is that no one had done anything on this scale before. <laughs> there was lots of experimentation. The laying down concrete here as part of the road system, which proved to be a disaster, and they had to dig it all back up. But you did not have a lot of communication. You know that picture I showed you of Vermont and Massachusetts? The road coming down from Vermont was 400 feet wide. The road that was going up to meet it from Massachusetts was going to be 300 feet wide. <laughs> you know that classic picture you've seen of out west where they have one train track going this way and one train track going that way? That happened often at borders because there was not always a lot of communication. The states themselves were left to decide how they were going to construct the roads, what materials they were going to use, what mixtures, everything like that. So there was a lot of experimentation because no one had done anything on this scale before. And sometimes it's several years down the road before they realize this doesn't work. We've got to go redo the whole kind of thing. Later on, I'll talk about what happened when they did the elevated rope up in Springfield. And there were people saying, even as they were building it, it won't last 10 years. And they're going to have to redo the whole thing. Now, I've been living up here for five years, and so far, I have never seen anything but construction on 91 going through Springfield. I'm convinced they've not finished it since they started it in 1960. But it's a mess, and, and, and one of the things that happens over the decade of this road, because it was finally completed through Massachusetts in 1970, one of the things that happened is a kind of awareness of what it takes to do this kind of project, and what the ramifications economically, geographically happen to a community when something like this is built in their midst. And you begin to get some reaction against the idea of just stepping aside and letting the government do this. Initially, some of the first town meetings, there was not a lot of outcry, especially in Burnston and down in Longmeadow. 
The first parts of the road constructed and finished in 1960 were two bits on either end, about five and a half miles, almost six miles, coming down from the border to Berniston, and then from the Connecticut border going up through Longmeadow. Those were the first bits that were finished, and they ran into huge trouble right off the bat in two kinds of ways that say a lot about what happens when a road like this gets built. And so it was, it was, it was a big learning experience about the significance of historical places, which no one had thought about. If you tried to build something now and you were kind of going to go through some historical part of town or historical building, there's all kinds of stuff that you have to do. But, you, but when this road began to be built, those kinds of questions were not asked. And we're going to see what happens when they do get asked. See anything ominous in this picture? This is the earliest picture I could find of the start of I-91. And it's that marker right there. I was interviewing a man named Alan Pratt up in Berniston. And, and I was trying to talk to him about, I was just starting with this thing, and, and I had heard that he had been there and had lived all along the building of the road. So I went over there, and you know, oh, I'm trying to fake that I'm a reporter. I'm sitting there with my little notebook, and I'm asking all kinds of questions, you know. And, and it was not really getting anywhere. And finally, he leaned over, and he said, would you like to see some pictures? And I said, you got pictures? He's like, oh, I took the photographs of the whole building of the road. <laughs> and he had this whole archive that no one had ever seen. And one of the pictures was this one. That is his son. And that is right smack in the middle. 91 will be built coming right down through there. Oh. And so that's the earliest, the earliest thing I have found pointing to a spot where 91 is going to be coming. The other thing that happens, of course, is the relocation of buildings. And again, I stick... I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Burniston a lot because that's the part I, I, I lived there for five years. So, so that, but also, too, in Burniston, you get the first kind of impact. This is the first place it's happening. This is the first place the road is constructed in Massachusetts. It's right here. And so you get some of the first reactions to what's going on. And one of them is the, the moving of, the, of Burniston homes. And so here, several century-old places to be raised in path of new Route 91. The moving of houses and the splitting up of farms is what happens when you bring a highway to a rural area. I want to read you a quote. This is from a documentary that was made back in the early 2000s called Divided Highways. It was about the building of the interstate system. And they talked to historian William Cronin. And so he's a talking head on the documentary. And he says this, the interstates gash their way through existing rural landscapes farming communities, small towns, and in many cases, it just destroys them. You drive down the interstates passing through farms where old family farms were going back to the 19th century, and the farmhouse is on your left, and half the fields are on your right, and the farm family now has its land split in that way if it keeps that land at all, and it has to commute two or three miles with its tractor to get to the other side of the highway to keep farming its land. That is a ripping asunder of old relationships that were present in the landscape and there's a kind of shattering of community that comes with that. I talked to someone whose house was moved. They picked it up, carried it all the way across to the valley, spun it back around, and set it back down. So it's still the same 150-year-old house, but it's on the other side of the valley looking the other direction. And that's if and when they could move it. Some of the houses couldn't stand being moved. And so you had them, they were just torn down. But right off the bat, you get this kind of, this, this jolting of the transformation of communities. Houses are being moved, farms are being split. And early on, there was concern about what happens with a project this big. I want to quote Lewis Mumford for you. I don't think anybody reads Lewis Mumford anymore, probably. But at one time, he was a big authority on, on city life and the city and history and stuff like that. And in the late 1950s, right after the, the 56, which I'll talk about, the 1956 bill that paid for the highways and established the highway system, he wrote an article for the New Yorker. And he said, building more roads, bridges, and tunnels so that more motor cars may travel more quickly to remote destinations and more chaotic communities from which more roads will be built that more tourists may escape from these newly soiled and clotted environments. 
Perhaps our age, he says, will be known to future historians as the age of the bulldozer and the exterminator. In many parts of the country, the building of a highway has about the same result upon vegetation and human structures as the passage of a tornado or the blast of an atomic bomb. Quite a thing to say in the late 50s and the smack in the middle of the Cold War. And this is before it all gets really up and going. So this is concerns about what is going to be happening. But these things, these, these, these voices about what it all means are going to be there in both contexts. Many people felt that this was going to be a very positive change. It felt looking toward the future. It felt like forward progress, as in many cases it was. One of the things that will happen once the interstate gets into place is people going further away for work, guys and girls dating each other from a distant town, spreading everything out. It becomes possible, once these towns are connected in this kind of way, to go further afield for stuff. I talked to one woman, and she said that when they were building 91, every summer we would go on vacation, and our vacation goal was to go to wherever the end of 91 was. <laughs> and Dad would stop, and that's where we would stay for a week. <coughs> and here's another one. The point of crossing, again, coming down. This is from Greenfield, the Greenfield Recorder from 59, I guess that is. So this, again, it, it, it's, it's early times for this kind of thing. But already, people are beginning to see what happens in a community when these kind of things are going on. And so the question that first appeared up in our area, the northern part, was right here. This is called North Parish. And it was a community, the first full community that 91 encountered coming down from the north, coming down from Vermont, that was going to be, and there's no polite way to put this, erased. The whole thing was simply in the way. And so a far, the Nash Mill Pond, and right here, you can see their congregational church. Here, you can see it's where the road's coming. So the road is going to plow right up through there. This is the community. This is the center and the church. And they are all going to be taken away. They move some of the houses. They rebuild the church further down the hill. But everything is going to get, is getting swept aside here. And like I say, when you go into the newspaper accounts and you read early reports, you don't get a lot of people... When they interview someone and ask them, so what do you think about the new highway coming through? They all say, well, it's just what the government's going to do. And it's progress. And it is progress. But also, too, it's a huge transformation of the society. And you have to ask, you know, well, why? Why such a big scale thing? Why, what is this? Bringing in these huge, gigantic roads and plowing through communities and neighborhoods. Well, to answer that, we have to back up and look at the establishment of the interstate system as a whole, where this idea came from. And we also have to look at the real driving force, if you will, of what's going on here. And that is the American love of the automobile. So let's start with a story. In 1939, John Steinbeck published The Grapes of Wrath. He won the Pulitzer Prize, and you know this story. The Joad families kicked off their farm. They all piled into jalopies, and they take Route 66, and they head to California looking for a new start and a new beginning. Well, the next year, 20th Century Fox did the famous movie with Henry Fonda, won Academy Awards. Well, it turns out a copy of this movie made its way to the Soviet Union. And they watched it. And they loved it. Farmers getting thrown off their land by bankers. People piling into these falling apart cars, going to the other end of the country where they're thrown into government camps. Well, what do you expect of a capitalist nation? And so they decide they're going to show the movie in Moscow theaters as anti-American propaganda, which they do. So it spreads out through all these theaters. 
Thousands of people go see it. And when these thousands of people all come out of the theater, they're all saying the same thing. Oh my gosh, we cannot believe what we have seen in America. Everybody has a car. <laughs> they were thrilled. What a place it must be. Well, of course, the Soviet officials realized they've made a catastrophic mistake showing this movie, and so it is immediately pulled from all the theaters. And that's the short but rather glorious history of the Grapes of Wrath in the Soviet Union. And yet, if I were to ask you to conjure an image that best reflects America's idea of itself, <laughs> you can't beat that, can you? <laughs> it's all there. Freedom, movement, piling everyone into the back seat and taking off for a new start in the next state or the next part of the country. Everything we love about who we are is hopping into that car. And along the bottom there it says, yes, you can enjoy air conditioning in your Rambler. <laughs> State of the art. And that's America, isn't it? So you have to start with and the first road trip. Where does it begin? I love the fact that the two greatest transformation in the 20th century of travel and movement, the airplane and the automobile, began in bicycle shops. Isn't that terrific? Talk about American ingenuity and thinking of something bigger and faster, the hallmark of the American mentality. I want it bigger and faster and cheaper. We start there, we start. The first magazine devoted to road improvement was published by bicyclers, okay? In 2003, Ken Burns did this documentary, Horatio's Drive, about the first transcontinental road trip. Horatio Nelson Jackson decides that he is gonna drive his 1903 cherry red Winton from California, from San Francisco to New York City. He does it on a $50 bet. How American is that? Uh, it takes him 65 days to do it. No one's looking at that thinking it's going to replace the train. But he does it going the opposite direction of the Lewis and Clark expedition as they had done 100 years before. Now, at the time he makes this trip, and he takes a camera, by the way, there are only about 150 miles of paved road. Everything else looks like that. <laughs> Maybe a couple of what are called corduroy roads, which were logs that were laid down. But 150 miles, everything else is that. And this is the first real indication of the disconnect of American transportation. The cars are going to get bigger and faster, and more and more people are going to have them, but the roads are not. The roads are going to stay in lousy, lousy circumstances. So here we have it, the first real highway, the Lincoln Highway that goes all the way from New York City to San Francisco to Lincoln Park. It was designed to be completed at the time for the 1915 San Francisco World's Fair, which it just barely made. And so here it is. It was believed that one road going across the country should probably be enough. <laughs> that should cover anyone who wants, whoever would want to go from one side to the other. Part of this road does survive. It's been incorporated into other roads now. But it was the first real attempt to create a road all the way across the country in 1915. And so in 1916, it's decided to explore the Lincoln Highway with a special motor convoy of the American military. 72 vehicles, 260 soldiers, 35 officers, and a 15-piece band. <laughs> they are going to journey and test out material. They're going to have all the state-of-the-art trucks. They're going to have everything they're going to need to go across the country to see how feasible it is to do this with the new technology that <coughs> evolved after the end of World War I. It was an absolute disaster. 
It took them three months to do it. One day, 14 bridges collapsed under them. One day, all oh, about half a mile, it was a three-mile convoy. And one day, about half a mile of it all just kind of slid off into a mudslide into a ditch. It took them two weeks to dig it all out. One of the travelers on it said, you know, on a good day, we made five miles a day. And there were never any good days. <laughs> and one of the men traveling with this group wrote a report about it. He was a second lieutenant. And he wrote a report saying, this will not do. This is not going to work. There has got to be a better way to create roads that are reliable. We could, we didn't know what state we were in sometimes. There has got to be a better way to do this. That second lieutenant's name was Dwight David Eisenhower. And he will come back into the story later on. So by the time you get to the 1920s, though, cars are more available. More and more people have them. Having a car becomes a statement of who you are. <coughs> the, the character of the traveling salesman enters into stories and novels. We start getting the first jokes about cars breaking down on the side of the road. You know, the guy fixing his car, and, and this couple in their horse and carriage go clumpy by and say, get a horse, which is where that comes from. So, you know, the first <laughs> jokes about cars breaking down. The first jokes about, oh, gee, honey, we're stuck in Lover's Lane, and I'm out of gas. <laughs> All of that begins in the 1920s. And also, two cars are getting better. The first enclosed car goes on the market in 1922. Now it doesn't matter what the weather is. It's not all wide open. All kinds of changes are going on. By 1929, a new car is rolling off the lines every 16 seconds. That's the good news. The bad news is about every 15 minutes, someone is dying in one of them. Because we are in the days long before any kind of safety in these vehicles. They're big, they're heavy. If they get out of control, they stay out of control. And so a huge transformation is happening in the culture. Cars are available. The Great Gatsby, the first novel that deals with cars. I mean, think about cars in that book. How the cars reflect who you are. And Babbitt, too, how much Babbitt loves his car. His car is his establishment of who he is. And I love the fact that the cover of this book has a look like it's looking out of a dashboard, doesn't it? Who you are in the society, how wealthy you are, how cultured you are. All of these things to begin, begin to be tied with the kind of car you drive, or the fact just that you have a car at all. <laughs> and then, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected, and he starts a whole new deal, and a lot of the new deal, the WPA, is working on roads. $1.8 billion will go into building new roads, new bridges, new tunnels, putting people to work, working on the roads. But the most important thing, really, is the fact that for the first time, we have a president <laughs> who loves to drive. Roosevelt bought his first car in 1908. He was hit with polio in 1921, but that didn't slow him down. When he was president, he had a Packard that was retooled so that he could drive it using just handles. He was, by all accounts, an unbelievably bad driver. And no one would get in the car with him. Winston Churchill told him, I'd rather face German panzers than get in the car with Franklin. <laughs> but he loved to drive, and that really meant something now. A president who's got his own car and loves to go tooling around the White House in it. So he comes up with what is the first concept of an interstate highway system. His initial notion is that it would be six toll roads, thinking six roads will probably cover it. Three going north and south, and three going east and west. And eventually, in 1944, you're going to get the first attempt to create an interstate system. The problem, of course, is in 1944, the war is going on. Cars are not being made. Factories are all being retooled to build tanks and jeeps and airplanes. So it's not until after World War II that things kick in, and I mean they kick in. There had been a vision of the future that had been emerging in the 1930s. 
the idea of a future world with big, this is from a 1936 movie called Things to Come. And look at that idea in 1936 of what they think the future is going to look like. It's going to be lots of highways and bridges and great big giant tall buildings. Well, guess what? They weren't the only ones thinking about that. So let's go to the 1939 World's Fair. The most popular ride at the World's Fair that year is this, Futurama by General Motors. It's a ride. You get on it, it holds 600 people at a time. You're around a big ring, and below you, down there, you can look over the glass down onto 36,000 square feet diorama of America in the gloriously future year of 1960. <laughs> there are half a million houses individually designed, 10-foot ten, ten tall skyscrapers, 50,000 cars on the roads, 10,000 of which actually move. It was a 15-minute ride, and people loved it. They could not get enough of it. Look at there. It was a glimpse of the future, and the future, well, obviously, is going to be big, tall, white skyscrapers and highways with no traffic. Yeah. That's the future. That's what it's going to look like. And wouldn't you know it, guess what happens? Guess what opens up in the fall of 1939, right after the fair ends? They called it the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The first townless highway is what this was called. A townless highway. Didn't go through towns, just traveled through the country. This was exactly what they had been seeing in the Futurama ride. 160 miles of uninterrupted road, rest stops, no speed limit originally. Do you know where they got that from? The Autobahn. Because the people who designed this road traveled and talked to the engineers in 1939 of the Autobahns in Germany. Sometimes I hear that, that Eisenhower saw the Autobahn that gave them the idea for the interstate system. Now, we're 10 years before all of that. And, or, well, yeah. And so, this is the idea of the future. Think of all the things that are going to come. To, think of all the associated business that emerge here. Motels, fast food restaurants, places to get off the road quickly and get back on with your gas. The notion of the road being the thing to get you on and to get you moving. Now, one of the things the idea of roads like this does is it adds an interesting new word to travel vocabulary. It's called bypass. It becomes possible now, well, to never go through a town at all if you don't want to. You can just travel on the big roads. And so this is what is going into the notion of an interstate system, these huge Townless highways that will span all across. Which brings us to the fabulous 50s. The golden age. The cars are affordable to everybody. Not only does the family have the car, the kid's got a car now. And he wants to go somewhere with it. And the whole world of the 1950s is it's centered around the car. You can have your family portrait made in the car. You can have your meals in the car. Don't even have to get out of the car. Think of the bell hops coming up and, and the car hops coming up and serving you there in the car. What kind of notion is that? Sitting in the car to eat. Well, it was a great novelty. And the idea is you're in a hurry. You're on the move. We got places to go and people to see. We're Americans on the move. We ain't getting out of the car. Even your entertainment can all be done in the car. And if you add the radio to this, well, there's no reason to never get out of the thing, is there? Everything you need is right there, made easy and available. The whole culture is shifting to fit people in cars. And then we get this guy's president. Eisenhower becomes president, and he has a couple of things on his agenda. 
One of them is the idea that he did get, not only from seeing the autobahns in Germany, but seeing the boulevards in Paris. We are now in the Cold War. The threat of nuclear strikes is in the air. And a real question facing the designers of cities and the designers of highways is evacuation. If a city gets hit with some sort of missile strike, and suddenly you've got tens of thousands of people, how are you going to get them out of the city? <coughs> and so one of the ideas that has always circulated around about the interstate system is its military intention. And it's interesting when you look at this, because if you read books written about the highway system in the 1950s, they will tell you that it was designed with military purposes in mind. And they will quote the one in five rule, which stated that for every five miles of highway interstate, one mile would be absolutely straight so that it could be used as a landing air sway. Now, when you get after the Cold War, you get a piece of saying, oh, I was never intended to be a military thing. It was a, it was a civilian plan all along. But of course, I think both of those things are going on. There was concern about evacuating large cities. There was concern in such a big country of moving military material. And so Eisenhower is the one who eventually will put through in, in Acts from 56 and 54 to build the highways. Now, the big issue as it always is, is who's going to pay for it. The original 1940s plan had been a 50-50 split. The federal government would pay 50, and the states would, say, would pay 50. And the states said, no. In the late 40s and the early 50s, it was, well, the government will pay 60%, and the states will pay 40%. And the states said, no. So when it finally passed in 56, the federal government pays 90% and the states pay 10%. But the states are in charge of the upkeep <coughs> of these roads once they're built. They can determine the speed limit on it. And they're in control of, of policing it and monitoring its upkeep. And so that finally got through Congress. And eventually, by the 1956, 57, 58, you start seeing those drawings of what it's going to look like. And construction in Massachusetts began in late 58 to create the first two little segments of the road. Now, this was what it was going to This is the attempt to put a square grid on a country that's not really square. But you can see the plan by looking at the numbers. From the bottom up, you've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 70, 80, 90 up here. And then at the far right, coming this way, you've got 5, 15, 25, 35, 55, 75, 85, 95. You can see an attempt to put a kind of grid of eastern roads and western roads that will cover most of the major cities and will allow access to all parts of the country. So there really is, even though it suddenly doesn't look like it when you look at all the roads that are on a map today, that there was a plan some of this, but there was, but if we're going to see some of the routes and how these routes are going to be determined and who's going to have to say so becomes extremely complicated. And it starts right at the beginning. Now I mentioned earlier that the first two bits of road that were built were the, the, from the Vermont border coming down to Burniston, there were 10 crosses 5, uh, 10 crosses 91. And a bit coming from Connecticut up to South Bend Bridge at Springfield. Well, it turns out both those places had bridges, and that proved to be a problem. This brings us back to that whole military question. There were not a lot of requirements. I mentioned the fact that there were a lot of different ways of building these roads. The federal government left that up to the states, but there was one requirement, and that was the height of bridges. They were told that all the bridges have to be 14 feet high. And so that's how they were built on these two locations. And then some sergeant put an ICBM, intergalactic, inter, international, inter, well, yeah, <coughs> a big, big missile on a flatbed truck, and it was 16 feet tall. And so word came down that all the bridges now had to be 16 feet tall, 
And so a whole lot of bridges had to be redone. Now what they did here in Longmeadow, they, uh, they went two feet down. Uh, although I've heard that at a, that a, that a bridge in, in Michigan, they used hydraulic lifts and lifted it up two feet. Hmm. Uh, but certainly the notion that there was no military intention of the building of the roads can't quite be true because one of the requirements was that all military vehicles would be able to go under any of the bridges that were being constructed. Okay. So I think it's funny that right off the bat we get two things happening that crash it. The first is this, where they have to redo the, redo the road under the bridge. <laughs> now I mentioned earlier um, Alan Pratt gave me some pictures. So I'm going to show one or two of these other pictures that he gave me. This was the one after the road had been constructed but had not been opened. And he saw a dog sled on it. You want to, and I'm sure there's, there's stories here. Some of the most interesting stories to emerge about the construction of the road is, you know what, when you get a great big flat space like that, people want to do all kinds of things on it. They want to get their horse on it. They want to get their motorcycle on it. They want to get their drag strip car on it. And so when, before, when the roads were completed, but before they were open, there were all kinds of stories about the police trying to monitor all of it. I mean, you've just got a great big expanse of road that's empty. Now, all kinds of people want to do all kinds of things. And one of the things he captured was this guy with a dog sled that was going down. This is, this is 91, completed but not open yet. <laughs> I also heard stories that there were pictures of the, um, the Stony Lee Burnham School field of the girls on horses on the completed 91 before it opened as well. And we dug all in the archives but we couldn't find any of those. Now this is a very famous moment from the 1960 opening. They opened up a little bit of the road coming from Greenfield up to 10, about two miles, and they decided to celebrate the opening by having a roller skate race. <laughs> so the first people who got to use the road were these people on their roller skates. And I had heard about this story, but I had never seen a picture of it. Alan Pratt he went to the opening of the road and had this photo. This is the only photograph I know of that shows the roller skaters. They're coming from Greenfield up. So there they are for the dedication. This was in uh, October of 1960. And here they are gathering again. There was a big speech here. Uh, Frank B. Dole, who had been, he was the assistant commissioner for the highways, said a really interesting thing, and I want to quote the speech he gave to you. The first parts of the road to begin to be completed, a lot of people are scared and nervous about them. And this is what he says. This is from his speech on the opening of this segment of 91. And as this section of Interstate 91 is dedicated today, I can't help but think how we have shortened distances. My father used to tell me about high-wheel bike trips he took as a boy. It was an all-day, arduous trek to Brattleboro over sandy dirt roads. As towns and cities are brought closer together, our whole way of life changes. There will be challenges and new growth. Many people have remarked on the unusual beauty of the completed section of this highway. Let us all hope that we shall continue to think in terms of a highway of beauty, convenience, and comfort, and not a slaughter way of terror. Because people were afraid of the big giant roads and the idea that people wanted to go faster. But I will tell you, as someone who has trawled through a whole lot of old newspapers, the wrecks on Route 5 were unbelievable. Every single day, someone's going off the road, someone's hitting another car. And the great danger was head to head collisions. One of the arguments made that the interstate travel is safer is the medium between the roads. There's a very distinct reason why you have that 100 foot gap, it varies, but usually it's about 100 feet, between northbound and southbound. It was safer. Also, you had less glare from other cars and the roads. And if you notice, if you look on a map, we tend to think of them as being straight or curvy here a lot. But if you look at the, the, the sinuous matter, the idea for an interstate is that it would regularly weave back and forth and up and down back and forth and up and down. This is very conscious on the designers to keep you awake and alert, to keep you paying attention as you were driving. It wasn't until they got out west that they quit caring about that. When they got out west, they just made it straight and went on forever. But earlier roads were designed with the notion of it being safe and of it being scenic. One of the things these roads often did was go up 
That lets you look over the landscape. One of the things I found striking about 91 when I moved up here is the fact that you can't see any of the towns from the road. It's only when you get off of the road and go down, well, there's the town. And that was designed as well. The, the idea of it being a scenic route, especially in a region famous for its foliage in the fall, you want a road that is going to go through and show the beauty of the landscape. This was conscious. So if I seem overblown talking about these roads crashing through neighborhoods, there was a real conscious effort to make it a scenic experience. The idea is that you're going to get onto these roads, go further perhaps than you have normally gone before, and that it would be convenient and it would allow you to see the country. Because more and more people, they, they, I mean, the notion of going off for a week on vacation emerges at the same time as well. Why? Because of the car. And so, by the time you get to the 1950s, by the time construction of all this is going on, you've got a real clambering for better and higher quality roads. So all of that is, is coming together. But something else happens as well. This is um, very important. The, for 66 years, the headmaster of Deerfield Academy. And he was one of the first people to make the argument in the, 1950, the late 50s about the importance of historic Deerfield. Because the original route for 91 came very close to historic Deerfield. And so he wrote a very famous letter, and I want to quote just a little bit of it because it's interesting what he said at a time when most people weren't really thinking about that. Here in Deerfield, the effect on Deerfield here would be, would be immense if the road came through here. Deerfield, which we have been making a real effort to preserve as a typical New England village of the pre-revolutionary period. In other words, in 1958, he's making the argument for historical preservation. One of the first times you have something like that happen, especially about something that is, in some respects, a village. Now, we're not talking about a giant monument here. We're not talking about a castle or a huge multiple. We're talking about carriage houses, and we're talking about small individual homes, and we're talking about an area that had been preserved that was important for what it said about the nation's history. So Bowen was one of the first ones to make the argument for historical preservation, and that voice gets louder as this progresses. By the time you get to the end, by the time you get to the end of the building of the highway system, there's a lot involved in trying to take these roads through historical regions. There are several stories repeatedly all around the country of construction on the road being stopped because of an outcry or an injunction. I want to talk about one that happened down in Long and uh, Long Meadow as well, an injunction that stopped construction for three months. <coughs> but that's something else that's happening. So at the same time you're having all this progress and all these roads evolving, you also have concerns about the historical preservation. Now, from 61 to 65, you get the middle, what I think of as the middle section. You get in 64, the section from Northampton to Waitley is finished, and 65 from Waitley to Greenfield, okay? And the exits from 21 to 24 began in 1961. And so you begin to get the middle part of the section done. It was the idea initially was to start north and work your way down with the idea being that the final construction will be Springfield, which everyone knows is going to be a disaster, as it absolutely was. And uh, so the idea was to start north and work your way down eventually and slightly come up from the south and, and Springfield and the elevated highway coming through there is going to be the last part of it done. But it all took rather longer than, than anyone thought. Uh, but one of the most striking visuals is this of it coming through the big oxbow. And I have a great story here. I was talking about doing this program to a man who's a teacher up at North. I, I work at, at North Carolina. And he was talking about when he was a kid and they were building this. And he said, you know, they would bring these dump because it all has to be filled in there where they're crashing it through the, the big oxbow. So tons and tons and tons and tons of dirt and rock had to be poured in. And he said, we would come home from school, and we would sit, and we would watch all the dump trucks going by all evening long, 
take in the dirt. And then the next day they would come back and they would be empty. And then the day after that they would be full of going back. And he said for weeks and weeks we would just sit and watch the dump trucks bring all the dirty to build the road. That was the thing he remembered most about it. And so again we have the landscape itself shifting away. Which brings me to Forest Park and the first attempt to stop in Massachusetts to actually stop the road from being built. Because the road was going to shear up through here, this is, this is a picture from about 1915, and so you had Barney Estate here, you have the road that's going to come up through here, it's going to take out Barney Estate, it's going to take out about 60 acres of the forest, of the, of the parkland, and the people stood up and said, you are not going to do this. Literally, there was, there was, there was uh, sleeping in at night and tearing up the machinery. Uh, it really was, it really was extraordinary. So they stopped construction for three months on the junction until they could work out some sort of plan to do something about what was happening. What they eventually decided to do was that they would build the road, they would take some of the park, but they would allow room for them to be able to. Here's another one of those lovely artistic renderings. And, uh, and this shows what's going to happen here. This is the estate that's going to get pulled down, right? So the road's going to come right up through here. And, uh, and this part of the park is going to get pulled away. There's two dilemmas coming up through this end. One is the fact that if you know where we are here, because this is the Connecticut River here, so we are east of the river. Now the problem is that Interstate 91 coming from the north is west of the river. So at some point, you've got to get back on the other side of the river. And this was a big, big debate about where to do that. And because it was such a controversial thing, it's why you have that incredible crazy turn. Yeah. When you were coming down, you suddenly turn over across the river. That was to get it away from new developments that were happening at North End. <coughs> and uh, also, too, to get it back on the other side of the river. It had initially been planned to always run west of the Connecticut River. But a big fight down in Connecticut had moved it over to the other side of the river. So when it comes up into Massachusetts, it's on the wrong side. And, uh, and so that's part of the construction that's going to be having to happen here. And again, that, again, I love these artistic renderings of how it's all going to look when we get done. Here's another one, and again, coming up. And right here was a big three-level, they called it the triple-decker highway. It was a hugely ambitious thing to do at this time. Again, you know, we're, you know a lot of stuff is, is, is some of these constructions and some of these roads are, are more ambitious than anything that had been tried before. And so they were really controversial. So this is what's going to happen when it comes through. This is what really happens, of course. This is the Barney Memorial Mausoleum here. The road's coming through here. And I don't said, I want to point out up here, there's a statue here called the Three Graces, which is still there. Uh, it was the end point for where they built the road. They were afraid that all of this hill would come crashing down. That's why they wanted to get rid of it uh, with the road coming that close. But eventually the injunction said that some part of it will be preserved. So the Barney House was moved and uh, eventually it was, it, this, this was kept. But I think it's really interesting that right here at the beginning of the building of the road coming through Massachusetts, you have people standing up saying, stop the road. And, uh, and so the idea of what's going on here really was a fight from the beginning about what's going to happen. Here's the, I love this for the headline. Autos go round and round, come out everywhere. Uh, this is the intersection there with five coming into 91. And, and, I, had a, and, and I had a friend when I was doing one of these programs before said that, that I, I told a story about this woman who grew up in this area in Agawam and all that. And she would talk about crossing over. And she would say, well, I was always terrified. I was terrified when we got on 91. Whenever we got on 91, I'd crawl into the floor of the backseat of the car and pray that we survived. And, uh, and I told that story, and this woman once said, you know, I still do that when I'm trying to get on 91. <laughs> Which is really the truth. That section there is just crazy with everything that's coming around. It, it, it is, and it's, and it's a reminder, too, that, you know, it, these kind of things are really sometimes like you're on a roller coaster ride. And it took so long finally to get the road finished. The running joke was that they called it Interstate 91 because that's the year it was finally going to be finished. <laughs> it took a lot longer, especially coming through here. And so these are two pictures. That, again, the artistic rendering on the left of what it's going to look like. Uh, always lovely. A spectacular change is downtown. Now the idea, of course, is if you've got a lot of traffic, in this case you've got traffic going over the river, 
that you don't want to interrupt for the building of the road. There's two things you can do. You can go above it or you can go below it. Okay, you go into Boston, you go under all of it. Well, it was decided to build an elevated road because then the traffic going from east to west uh, and from Springfield and across would not be that bothering. So, so the result was to build a big elevator, a very ambitious thing to do. And uh, it was delayed for lots of reasons, but there's a really big one. The idea was the complete construction of this in 1968. This was the, this was the elevated and then the, the segment that's our big curve. The last part of the road built was from where, one, where 291 comes into 91, that segment all the way the big turn going over around toward Chicopee and then going up to Mass Pike. That was the very last segment, then, that five and a half miles. So these were the plans, but it took a long time for this to happen. And that's because of history sticking its nose into the best laid schemes of man. It was called the Vietnam War. In 67 and 68, President Johnson directed the money that was supposed to go to federal aid to Vietnam and uh, building a material to be sent over there. And so that took a lot of money that had been set aside for the building of this road. And it happened right as they were working on the Springfield say that the money was diverted away. So they were so so production uh, construction that was very, very delayed. It took four years to build that segment instead of the two years that it was planned. And so it didn't get finished until 1970. So the plan had always been along. 58 to 68 was the decade they were going to be done with it. But it took until 1970 because of the delays of, um, as a result of the war. So it was so, so sometimes sometimes the delays are, have all kinds of stories behind them. And there it is completed when it would go down. 110,000 cars a day travel through Springfield. 16,000 cars a day travel through uh, the northern part of 91. So you've got a very, very busy, busy road. And you've got the reason why we have so much commerce, why we've got people who work all the way to the other end of the county now. The roads have done that as well. And you have places that aren't really there anymore. Because coming back to what the old, my, old, my friend said about Route 5, gas stations, garages, that need, these, these kind of places really need you to break down somewhere near them. <laughs> it doesn't help them at all if you break down on the highway. They would have means to go out and get you from there. But initially it didn't. And the backed up traffic, because even long before the highways were here, you had the people going to see the fall leaves all the way up to five and then across ten. You had all these roads packed, packed, packed. Most people can tell you what it was like on Route 5. Bumper to bumper traffic, especially on Saturdays and Sundays. And now suddenly, there's no one coming through. So how do you adapt? So I want to lose this one story as an example of an adaptation. The Foley Flover in Burmeston was a, a car hop place. They didn't have the girls on the roller skates, but they did go out and they mounted that <coughs> thing on the side of the car. And you could sit in your car and eat. Well, then the highway came through and they made an extraordinary discovery. Once people start going on vacations, once people are spending four or five hours in the car, they're sick to death of being in the car. <laughs> they're sick to death of the kids in the back screen, <laughs> screaming and saying, well, we're going to stop and go to the bathroom. So they stopped doing the car hops and built an air-conditioned dining room <laughs> and put signs up on the air they saying, come off the road for an air-conditioned dinner. <laughs> and it proved absolutely brilliant. That's exactly what people do. That's one way change and adapt. And the four-leaf clover is still there today. Uh, and I, I think it's a great story because it does indeed show the ways that you change to adapt to something like this too. You know, faster food, faster gas exchange, having all kinds of things on the highway, all, just off the highway. Um, the roundabouts, oh, I have to tell you, uh, we don't have roundabouts in the south. <laughs> And that was, that was quite an experience for me. I think I spent an hour on the first one I ever came to. <laughs> Just going around and around and around, trying to figure out how I can get out of here without dying. We don't have those down my way. 
Um, but the idea even there, too, to keep it flow, to keep the flow of traffic. Because that's the thing about a growing population, the ability of all many different kinds of cars. We get this, the proposed freeway to remove the bottleneck created by the previous proposed freeway, to remove the bottleneck created by absolutely right. We get this. <laughs> yeah, right. You think you're keeping the work fast. Oh, bam. Let me back up. There we are. So we get this, don't we? Now we, and now we have more and more roads that are needed. Now we have more and more traffic. The other thing that happens during these years is concern about automobile fumes. New issues emerge with the creation of the interstate highways. Concern about noise. I can hear every time an 18-wheeler goes slightly off the road on 91. If you live anywhere near one of these roads, you can hear that. Hear it all the time. Noise pollution. Concern about what is happening to the atmosphere as a result of emissions <coughs> from automobiles. This kicks in in the 1970s, and it's no surprise it kicks in right after the end of the building of the highway system. Because suddenly you've got that many cars out there. No one had been prepared for that. All the roads are already clogged. They're getting in and out of cities. It's absolutely awful steel. And so it becomes a, a, a whole new kind of thing. Now, I started out with a story by John Steinbeck, and I want to end with a, with a quick quote from him from Travels with Charlie. Now, this is a, this is a classic book where he, uh, he takes a road trip around America. But what's often not realized is he did this in 1960, the book came out in 1961. And so he's one of the very first people to actually travel on the new intercities. You know, he, he sticks close to the smaller roads, but he gets on, I believe it's I-90, he doesn't name it, but he gets on one of the early highways, and this is what he writes about it, this is 1961, I'm sorry, 1962, he traveled, he made the trip in 1661. The minimal speed on this road was greater than any I had previously driven. I drove into a wind quartering in from my starboard bow and felt the buffeting, sometimes staggering blows of the gale I helped to make. Instructions screamed at me from the road. Do not stop. No stopping. Maintain speed. Trucks as long as freighters went roaring by, delivering a wind like countryside. You are bound to the wheel and your eyes to the car ahead and to the rear view mirror of the car behind and the side view mirror of the car talk about the past. And at the same time, you must read all the signs for fear you may miss some instructions or orders. No roadside stands selling squash, no antique stores, no farm products or factory outlets. When we get these throughways across the whole country, as we will and must, it will be possible to drive from New York to California without seeing a single thing. <laughs> 1962. And so I want to end <coughs> on something you can't see. This is the mill pond in the middle of Burns. I've heard all kinds of stories about people when this froze over and they would go ice skating and when they would go fishing in it and go swimming in it. And this is the intersection of 91 and 10 today. It came right through this pond. And so it's not there. But I love a wonderful little tidbit someone told me. They told me that when it really, really rains a lot, that part of the intersection floods. And I like to think it's the revenge of the pond. <laughs> Coming back out and taking over a little bit of the landscape. I love that notion. Because changes like this, I love collecting stories about this, and I would like to end with, with you sharing some stuff. We become, in many ways, the keepers of the places where we have lived and known. In 1995, I got a call from my father. And he said, if you want to go see the house you grew up in, you better go this week. They're going to pull it down. It turns out that while I had moved away and was gone off to college and then was living in another part of the state, the entire eastern half of the town I grew up in, a little mill town called McCandle, the entire eastern half of the town had been sold as a block to a developer. Uh, a developer whose name I always felt sounded like the name of a 1920s flapper. 
the company was named Saucy Burbank. <laughs> Saucy Burbank bought half of my town and raised it to the ground. And so when my dad told me, if you want to go see your house, you better go see it because it's the last one. And I thought he was being dramatic, but he wasn't. It was the last house standing. It was like one of those creatures you see of a tornado coming through a neighborhood and leaving one house and, and, and knocking all the other ones down. That's exactly what it looked like. All the other houses had been pulled down, and our house was standing there by itself. And three years later, when I went back, there was nothing whatsoever left of the neighborhood I grew up in. They had completely re-landscaped it. You know, you expect change. You expect to go buy a house you grew up in many years later and see a different swing set in the front yard, or, or that they've painted it, or if they, what they do here in New England, you add stuff to the back so the house just keeps going further and further back. <laughs> That's really cool. I've never seen that either. The houses just keep going further and further back. You expect that kind of thing, but you don't expect the two trees in your front yard to be wrenched out of the ground. You don't expect the hill behind your house to have been leveled out. Even the roads they have been So when I go back to the town I grew up in, there's not a trace of where I grew up left. And so in some ways, I'm the keeper of that place now. I remember what it was like. I remember in our bike spinning wheels down at the turn of the road. It's not there anymore. And so I want to do with this program is to make you see the wonderful things that do happen as a result of progress, but also to remind you that you may be a very important keeper of a place that you know that is not there anymore. And so tell people about it. Share photographs. I really fussed at Alan Pratt for setting on all those pictures of the creation of 91. I was like, he never showed anybody to his family. And I said, get in touch with the local history group and let them know about this. That's an extraordinary record, not only of a transformation of a landscape, but of a move from a landscape from one type of life to another type of life. You, you have a record of that. And so you hear, I love getting a chance to talk to you, historical society, people who care about place and who are about remembering and preserving these kind of things. So the next time you're on 91 and you travel up through the northern part of the state and you look over to the right and you see this little clump of asparagus. I want you to think, you know, it's nice being a nice fair condition car and it's nice to be able to drive up to Brattleboro to go to a concert. But I don't wonder who's garden. I wonder whose farm this land once was. That too is part of remembering and preserving. Thank you. <laughs>